For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Sophia McLennan. I'm the director of the Center for Global Studies, and I'm also a professor of inter international affairs and comparative literature here at Penn State. And I want to thank everybody for finding time in what is, again, uh, almost seems like a spring-like day to make it and join us here. Um, I also want to start by taking a moment to ta thank our various co-sponsors of this event. Uh, all of these events take a lot of energy and also a lot of resources. So we want to thank in particular the Department of Political Science, uh, the Global and International Studies Program, the Humanities Institute, the McCourtney Institute for Democracy, uh, Penn State Global, the Rock Ethics Institute, and of course, the School of International Affairs, where, uh, which is hosting us also in this space. Um, I also want to thank the, the staff at the Center for Global Studies that participated in putting this event together. In particular, uh, Caitlin, I have their, up back there, so raise your hand so everyone can see you. Caitlin, Amber, Emily, Morgan, uh, Lauren, and Maddie because uh, they did a ton of work to put this together too. There's one extra thank you that I want to do particularly for Serja, because there's a number of students in this room that work, have worked directly on the research that he's going to be talking about today. So we've got Caitlin, uh, Ivy, right? Who else is in here who's worked on the project? Um, Emily has also, yeah, she's busy taking photos. So probably over the course of the beginning of this project, I believe something on the order of 12 different student of international affairs, uh, school of international affairs and just general Penn State uh, students have been involved in this project. It's been massive. Um, many of them are out already pursuing careers. Um, so now let me get to our guest speaker. Our guest speaker, Serge Popovich, has focused on activism, democracy, and human rights issues since his 20s, when the repressive dictatorship of Slobodan Milosevic in Serbia took him away from fishing and punk rock and forced him into political action. In 1998, Popovich co-founded the student movement Otpor, which means resistance, um, which played a crucial role in ousting Milosevic. After briefly serving in politics, Serge founded the Center for Applied Nonviolent Actions and Strategies, what's called CANVAS as an acronym, a non-private organization based in Belgrade. CANVAS aims to translate the experience and tactics used by Otpor into training for activists all over the world on how to be successful in nonviolent conflict. So far, the organization has worked with activists from 46 different countries. In 2012, he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, and he's also been listed as one of the top 100 global thinkers by, by the Foreign Policy Magazine. In 2014, he was listed as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum in Davos. Um, Serja and Canvas have won several awards, including the Paul Artson Award for Human Rights, the Jean Meyer Prize by Tufts University, and of course, the Brown Medal uh, for Democracy by Penn State. Serge is the author of Blueprint for Revolution. He and I also work together on Pranksters versus Autocrats, Why Dilemma Actions Advance Nonviolent Activism, both of which will be available for you to reserve for a free copy I think many of you saw you could sign up out front and we'll get you not just a free copy, but a free signed copy. Um, in the foreword to Blueprint, he writes, the ideas and the stories in this book are meant to be not only understood, but felt like a great rock album. They're meant to get you on your feet and moving. And they're meant to convince you that even though the suits, the bullies and the brutes the whole cadre of grim men who usually run things may look invincible. Often, all it takes to topple them is a good bit of fun. 
I'm sure he'll carry that same sentiment as he speaks to us today. His talk is entitled, A Magic Formula for Social Change, How Humor, Dilemma Actions, and Creative Tactics Can Save Democracy. Please join me in offering a warm welcome. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, uh, thank you for having me here. This is my second time at the Penn State. Uh, Serbs are like cockroaches. They keep coming. So you see one, you better move because there will be more of them coming. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for like, this is a very interesting intro to what I'm going to talk. And part of this will be this phenomenon of creative activism and how you structure successful tactics and how you make a dilemma for your opponent and what is the little grain of humor because very often things are more effective if they are cool and funny the other part is uh, that there was a day in time that uh, me and sofia over a very specific substance produced only in serbian called rakia which is a type of schnapps that you make out from the fruit decided to give it some kind of the scientific background. Uh, four years after, there is a whole team of people working from, from uh, this school on this, and they produce some marvelous data and marvelous results, and soon we will have a website with all these things on. So thank you for making this, for more, somehow smuggling this into academia, which is always a problematic thing. Okay, I'll start talking about the, the thing first. And first of all, uh, what is really interesting is that I've spent, as Sophia says, I'm an activist from the necessity. I never thought I would be an activist. I'm an I'm enthusiastic bass guitar player with a training in freshwater biology. So I have nothing to do with political. I had never had one class of political science aside of those that I visited or taught. And, uh, uh, but I ended up being in a country where there is a guy who think that dictatorship is a good idea. And, uh, he was really pursuing this idea. And uh, within the range of a three or four years, from me being 18, 19, to me being maybe 22, my whole world fell apart. Coming from a decent cosmopolitan rock environment, I ended up in an isolated country where only drill is to hate neighbors and go to war and kill them. Out of freedom of all religions, or even better, no religion at all, we ended up being Orthodox, while the Croats are Catholics, and we need to kill some Bosnians because they are Muslim. Uh, out of the decent middle class life, I'm son of the two pretty successful journalists. Uh, I ended up watching my father selling smuggled petrol on the street in order to survive. So every single aspect of your life is falling apart. You are in your 20s. You have two choices. You fight or you flee. And a lot of people decided to flee. 300,000 young people left Serbia in the 90s. That's a country of 6 million. Imagine losing 5% of your human capital within a decade. That's very difficult to survive. However, some of us were more stubborn and we started fighting this thing and very unlike academic approach where you're looking at the cases and you're building the data sets, Serbs are like the big teenagers. They never read books, they learn by doing. So this is like the same way my 10 year old is learning that the, you don't touch the stove, you don't touch the stove, you don't touch the stove, but he will never learn until he puts his hand in it and gets burned. And this is how he learns. Don't speed on the bike, don't speed on the bike, don't speed on the bike, next thing, surgery on the hand, you know the deal. So basically we started with protests 992. They were nice and naive and musical, but they were not really working. Range of protests 996, 97 where we caught Milosevic stealing local elections, all the way to 2000, where we build a strategic movement, build strategy, build numbers, win the elections, get the country to general strike and make him concede. And then I made this, uh, well, it was a natural mistake for a young person. I went in a government in a parliament for three years. I was a member of the Serbian National Assembly and I was wearing a tie up and uh, Converse sneakers down because the camera catches you only this way to the top uh, but basically i was trying to change the beast from the inside and then around 2003 a movie called bringing down dictator came out very good pbs awarded documentary about the serbian struggle 
And there is this crazy guy called Peter Ackerman who think maybe if we translate the movie and give it to free to the activists of the world, they will get ideas. And he really did it. He paid for tens of thousands of copies being translated into Farsi and into whatever is the dominant language in Burma and whatever is the dominant language in, well, I know what the dominant language is in Zimbabwe. But, and then these people start crawling towards the dog. And they start so boom, there's an email. Somebody from Zimbabwe wants you to come to South Africa to explain the principles. There's somebody from Belarus. This is when we get expelled from Belarus. Somebody from Georgia, somebody from Ukraine. And then based on these principles, the Rose Revolution in Georgia happened. The Orange Revolution in Ukraine happened in 2003 and 2004. And we figure out, wow, this may be working. So this is where the organization I run uh, Center for Applied Nonviolent Action Strategies were born. And this is what I do for the last 20 years of my life. I'm teaching people how to build movements and basically make troubles, which is probably the very rare industry niche. If you take a look at it, I don't know much people who do this for a living, but I really do. So eventually uh, we start breaking this down and looking at the tools and looking how some of these tools works. And of course, we are very excited about the tactics and we teach tactics still. And when you look at the tactics, unlike all people are born equal, not all the tactics are born equal. So some tactics just work, some tactics don't work. So we're looking into why they work when they work and why they don't work when they don't work. And we came to the very interesting uh, matrix in which the tactic doesn't come first. Okay, I'll try to explain this differently. You want to change the world, you're angry about the shit, you go on the street and you protest. So you get engaged in the tactics first. But instead of that, successful movements look at the target first. Montgomery bus boycott was successful because majority of users of public transportation in Alabama at the time were people of color. So like a soldier's, preparing for a battle, the civil rights movement understand that they need to put their strong points, numbers, they were the majority of the consumers, against the opponent weak points, which is these businesses were funding governors and legislators that were supporting segregation. And then like in dominoes, bring one domino down to bring the second domino down to eventually persuade uh, uh, governors to desegregate buses. So preparation works. And then we came to the completely different idea of tactics, which is that fun works, creativity works. But why it works when it works and how it really works, this is what we are going to take a look into today. So basically, this is nothing new. But people very often associate, these are the great revolutionaries of 20th century, the Chairman Mao, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, and of course, Josip Broz Tito, the strongman of my own country. I need to put him there. A little bit of the local patriotism always helps. And look at them, they're serious. Of course they are, because they are involved in a serious business of revolution. And I, I, I offered 50 bucks prize or somebody who find me a chef photo smiling. I was made by a student after three months. So I found one, but they're always very serious. So is the face of the revolution really serious? Because when you take a look at the nonviolent protests globally, they are really looking like they're having fun. So now, how this fun effect, how this humor effect, how this lightheadedness effect compares with the serious business and where is the balance. One of the obsessions that we have and we turn it into the scientific research is to figure out this cool factor. Okay, now we, we hired a psychologist to deal with this because it should be a little bit wider than my anecdotes. Think of it this way. There is an engine of status quo where we are talking about the oppressive government where we are talking about the suppressed human right, where we are talking about the corruption. And like in video game, you need to understand the engine to win the video game. And the engine of video game is you kill more zombie Nazis, you get more health and life. Or in Pac-Man, you eat more of these little dots, 
you become happier and then if the ghosts catch you you lose some this is the engine so the engine of of autocracy the engine of oppression the engine of status quo is twofold it's either apathy or fear stupid autocratic regimes play on fear fear is a very difficult engine to maintain because you need to oppress 60 million people of iran with the national revolutionary guard and religious police and if they break fear you need to instill more fear and this costs money and their coffers are empty clever dictators they play on apathy ah you know putin is bad but what about war in iraq so creating this apathetic society where nobody believed change is possible is autocracy advanced this is the next level of autocracy humor and cool tackle world and this is where we talking about the power of creativity the power of we call leftivism why because it's in our human nature and it has nothing to do with the politics or dictatorships or social change i will start with fear think that you are preparing for a major surgery so the surgeon comes in and says, okay, there we are going to open your chest first. Then we are going to put this lovely metal instruments to open your ribs. And then look at this scalpel. This is really, doesn't really help, yes? Instead of that, your friend comes and cracks a joke. And immediately the fear disappears. It is the nature of the humor and laughter and physiology and psychology to break the fear. These are these two things cannot live in the same room, okay? Now think about the apathy. You are at the most boring party in the world where nobody's having fun, everybody's sitting and drinking themselves to death, and you are thinking that you're about to leave, as opposed to somebody really funny comes in, and everybody surrounds that somebody really funny, and immediately everybody feels good, and immediately people are laughing, then you want to stay. So cool attracts people to the movement and that's one of the things that we wanted to test if you're creative if you're cool does this boost numbers because numbers is how you win in a non-violent struggle another thing is also who is your opponent in most of pro-democracy struggle this is how your opponent looks they are green Milosevic was this gray bureaucrat Mugabe was always super serious Mubarak had only one face expression. Like they, they call him the wax president because he looked like a wax figure, you know, doesn't change faces. So all of these guys are very serious. They need to portray themselves as a serious brand. So what happens when you mock them? How do they respond? And we also found a very strong relationship between the level of authoritarianism and the effectiveness of use of humor and dilemma action. The more your opponent needs to project himself, and it's always himself, there are no female dictators that I'm aware of, the more your opponent tries to project himself as a school bully, the more they are prone and susceptible to this type of tactics. Proven data sets, numbers, I'll go with numbers. So now, now we move to history. So everywhere you look, and that struck us the most, and we ended up digging like uh, archeologists, the cases of dilemma actions from, I don't know, thousands of years ago. It's really weird. It's like we started in a, in a, in a Eastern Europe in the 80s, and we ended up in ancient Egypt. I mean, it's really, really weird. You find these things. It's like there are jokes in Perestroika, and this one of the, most popular cases of dilemma action, the one that always grabbed my attention was from Poland. And we are talking 80s, and we are talking the Russian troops are still there, and we are talking about the state controlled TV news, which are very often very fertile ground for people to mobilize. And they're in the same time of the day. And there is a curfew, and people cannot go out and protest. But then people came to this marvelous idea that while the TV news are playing, and this is where TV still has three dimensions. You know, there was a day in time where TVs were not flat. They were like square things. They were looking like this. So they would put their TV in baby strollers or in a grocery cart and take them for a walk. 
So the TV news are playing and there is a bulk of people strolling their TVs in a neighborhood. A, they see each other, they recognize what they stand for, they don't feel alone, which is a very important effect in autocracy. B, this is nothing illegal. So they cannot be arrested. One of the elements of successful tactics is being able to do a thing and still get away with it. So not you're going to be killed because of scrolling your TV. And then the most important thing, they had fun. Part of the successful movement is giving people this feeling that not only you are doing good, but you're feeling good while doing good. And this psychologically means a lot. Because a lot of people, at least in, in my experience, will join movement because of the fun of it, because their friends are there, because they feel good. Okay, they will share values with you, but values themselves will not make them do things. It is the feeling of good. So how many people were really into understanding the war and everything that were on the Woodstock? They came to the Woodstock because Woodstock was the thing. And if you're not being in the Woodstock, you're not into the thing. And everybody wants to fit in. So why simple tactics as this work, how people come to this idea, and of course what the government will do. Now the government needs to expand the curfew, starting before TV news. So now you had the government needing to do a defense while you're doing a small perpetuary offense. And people feel victorious because they achieved something. Now, digging in the past get us to the 1905, 420 different cases. Some of them are amazing. So human creativity, when put in the context of the protesting, okay, I'll give you just two different things. Russia started the war in Ukraine. And of course, you can't even call it war because it's special military operation. The moment you call it war, you go to jail. And of course, you cannot protest about it. So people start going on the street saying no to war. They were arrested. They lower the participation bar a little bit lower. They come out with the papers which were saying no war, but only the beginning letters. Oh, like, like N and W, okay. N, V, no, Vojna in, in Russian, but these two letters. Now, police needs to arrest you for having two letters on a piece of paper, which makes trial process a pretty bit complicated. And then the blank paper. So eventually, people were arrested in Russia with protesting with a blank paper. You understand the beauty of this? This is a thought process where you're not only involving what you are doing, but also making life miserable for those that needs to arrest you. Hijab thing in Iran. It's a crazy place that tries this. this idea that somehow you can impose hijab on now 15, like there is a 15 million Iranian teenagers as we speak. Imagine the level of resources you need to impose anything. On. So they don't want to wear hijab, but we will make them wear hijab. So when they don't wear hijab, we beat them and we rape them and blah, blah, blah. So they killed the girl. Maksa Amini. And the protest spreads across the Iran. The regime wasn't able to accommodate, but they wanted to impose more. But because nobody's following this rule, that's the problem. They send a letter to businesses in Iran, say, if you own a small business, it is your duty to make sure women are properly scarred or we find you. And now in every apothecary in Tehran, Women are scarred, but men are scarred as well. So it's not illegal. You show solidarity. When you walk into this apothecary and see scarred men, you immediately get the message. I mean, this is no, you know why these men are scarred, yes? And it's fun. So understanding the, how rich is this thing and how it's happening everywhere, was the first kind of a shock when we were digging into it. So it's older than we thought, it's cooler than we thought, and it works better than we thought. 
Now, we were looking at the several parameters on how this type of actions, we call them dilemma actions, or if you add a grain of humor, it becomes a loftivism, how it helps movement. So we were looking at whether the numbers grow, because the numbers, the people joining the movement, this is the first indication that you win. Because by a very important research done by Chenoweth and Stefan, you need between five and 8% of the population to be active, and then you win. So if you can raise numbers to the 5% of the population, you have about 50% of chance for your demands to be met. Second, they obviously decrease fear, but they also get the outsized media coverage. So the media coverage of something well-designed, small, especially if it makes your opponent do a stupid thing, is un unprecedented in comparing to the investment. Because for the investment of a little dilemma action, you get all of the media coverage in the world and whether this is a positive media coverage and things of that kind. And then the interesting thing for us was also how it works in democracies, how it works in autocracies. So these were the three alleys that we kind of took. So this is how we learn it. We learn it by doing it. And we're the group of 23 people, I think, at the point, so very small. We're like, okay, we want to be noticed. We want, like, we want to play this jiu-jitsu because we, if we piss Milosevic and his police does something to us, that will draw attention to us from the people that we want to recruit. So we were using our open and strength, like in a martial art, to get what we want. So we went to the guy who had a scrap junkyard, got this big, ugly petrol barrel. This is not the original one. The original one was Milosevic's face, nicely painted. And then we bring it to the main shopping district. And there was a hole on the top. So if you put a coin in the top, you get yourself right, get a nice bat, and you can hit the scumbag three times. And then you give it to the next person. And then she or he puts a coin. So within 20 minutes, there's like a line of the people ready to do this. And the kids are around, and they're kicking the barrels. And it's loud and it attracts more people. It's not like it's turning into a carnival. So we pull back, order espresso, and observe the situation. But that was not the real fun. The real fun is when police arrive. What the heck will they do? So now here is something they are ordered to stop. So there is an order that they need to fulfill. We are not there, so there is nobody to get arrested. So the guy who organized there, checkbox empty. Now they're looking at these downtown shoppers, decent people with their kids. If they arrest them and take them to the police station, they will charge them with what? I'm just telling you the thinking process of the police. So they could have arrested them, but they will be out in two hours. And some of them will sue their butts because they're detained for no, with no breaking a law. And because they need to stop this, they decide to arrest the bar. Because that's the only thing they do. They can do well, what the heck they do. And so the two, these three miserable guys dragging the barrel to the police car. And it was hit several hundred times. So the face is already in a very nice shape. It's metal, so it's kind of deformed. And of course, people are taking their cameras out and the cell phones, and they're making photos. And it ends on the cover page outside, uh, outside the media impact of the only Serbian opposition newspaper at that time, Blitz. This three miserable guys dragging this barrel to the police car. And the uh, fun thing, now you look at it from the point of power gain. First, people have heard about us. Second, people think we are cool. Because you need to be cool to pull a prank like that. Brave, but also cool, yes? Third, the very most important pillar of oppression in Serbia was the police. Military was conscription, so they were not participating in arresting people, killing people, that was not their job. Now, the most important pillar that everybody should be afraid of, police, they look like damn idiots. So you destroy the authority of the opponent, you send a cool message, you appear on the radar screen of the people, 
you appear in the media. And of course, everybody want to learn about this new group. So we recruited a bulk of people. So this is how we figure out that playing this card will work. But it will work only if it provokes answer. Because it is not the barrel itself that won the day. It is the police arresting the barrel, which really push it out of the top. And specifically this idea where you are creating a play and they have the role in your play. You know, you just invite them and they do what you want them to do and they look stupid and then they leave and everybody comes out with a round of applause. And this feeling that it is all a little bit theatrical and stuff like that, while everything else looks gloomy. And then this thing was, of course, replicated over and over. So you can go anywhere. You can look at the 2011. You can look at these, how you use digital images, like 15 days between revolution and, 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 and yeah, this is this self-explanatory, yeah. So this is not that there, there must be a teenager have designed this within 17 seconds. That's how much it will take them to do this thing. So you try to remove the virus, but it does mm, there's this sound. And you know, it's like this thing which says, like, life is too short to check on your USB. Like when you say, do you want to check on your USB? So life is too short. And same, same here. So you need to remove the mobile first. It's like you, you have this explosion of thousands and thousands of different tactics. And they are all low risk and they're all cool. And they're all coming from a unaffiliated groups and they all work well in breaking the fear, because who have done this and how they will arrest you for having this on your computer? There is no police force which can chase 3 million Egyptians who have this on their computers. Now, sometimes it's oversight. So, like 2012, Putin would probably win elections in Russia with 60% or 66 but his pedestrians, they wanted him to win with a 99. So they were stuffing ballot boxes. And they were caught stuffing ballot boxes. This is the era of the cell phones. And people start protesting. But of course, clever as it is, Putin will let them protest in Moscow. But everywhere else, they couldn't do it. Maybe a few other cities. So the people of Barnaul, Siberia, which is a 16,000 village town, however you name it, somewhere in the Far East, they came to the idea that because they cannot protest, their toys may protest. So they build a little legal city, and there is this downtown square, which has this little old Soviet monument, and on the pedestal of the monument, there were these penguins, and there are legal soldiers and cars. There's like 136% for Putin. And there is an actual footage of this thing. Like somebody was having an actual footage. And there is this moment when they build this, and there are like two policemen are there, probably two out of five. I don't know how many policemen Barno has, but it's not a formidable police force. And everybody knows everybody because it's a village, you know, it's not. And even policemen are taping because it's so fun. And then it has 700,000 views on YouTube that night. And some of these views are from Kremlin. And now they're looking at it and they're figuring it out because they're very, very intelligent. They're evil, but intelligent. And they need to do something about it because if they don't do something about it, they'll have 10,000 toy protests in three days because people tend to replicate this thing. And one of the things that we figure out that a lot of these dilemma actions are not only appealing, are not only poking, are not only fun, they're also inspiring people to try it at home which is a very important feature of the successful tactic, is if it can spread horizontally without the organization. Okay, here comes the order, the phone is ringing, the poor soul, the chief of police in Barnaul needs to give the probably the most stupid statement in the history of the law enforcement, saying that a scheduled protest of 100 kinder supplies, toys, 100 legal people, 20 model soldiers, and 10 toy cars is banned officially because the toys are not citizens of Russia. And by constitution, only citizens of Russia can protest in Russia. Yeah? They're what, made in China, something like that. And then it ends on the cover page of Guardian. So here is the, in the middle of nowhere place in Russia where you cannot find on the map, 
Here is the little prank pulled by five parents. This is parents thing. I have so much of this plastic shit at home, I can tell you. <laughs> Trust me. And there is zero investment. Like they, they invested two hours of their time. This costs nothing. This, they, they pulled this from their kid supplies. They didn't buy this. And then you have whole world talking about it. So once again, talking about the outside media income, but it comes only because police ban it. Like it's not the toy protest, but the reaction to the toy protest. So there must be a reaction of your opponent. And the beauty of this is that the reason why we call it Alam Action, this is very much like that since Salt March, which is probably the best documented Dalam Action ever. This is Gandhi's idea that India has 4,000 miles of sea coast. All you need to make salt is a, you know, two square meters of a sea coast, sun and sea, and it is taxed by Brits. So we are making our own salt in India, which is then taxed by Brits, which we pay tax to Brits to oppress us. So one of the elements of successful dynamic action is understanding where the bizarrity of the situation is. So you want to get into this bizarrity and expose bizarrity, because that plays to the wildly held belief. And of course, widely held belief is if this is our coast and we are using this salt, why the heck we're paying tax to Brits? This is, you need to explain this. It's pretty stupid, huh? So he walked from Dundee and he was also the master of making it big. So he started with 50 people and they were all walking barefoot and they were gaining numbers as they were going. And they came to the sea coast and he was the first one to break the ban and produce the salt. But this is where the genius kicks in, because Gandhi was a really clever strategist, really clever. He could probably be a chess champion if he would play chess. Now, what the Brits will do? They have to do something. If they ignore the problem, everybody will be making their salt. Nobody's going to pay taxes. It's going to cost them money. If they arrest Gandhi, there, is a, there was a law at the time saying that if you break the ban on, on ABC, this was called the uh, illegal production of goods or something like that. That was uh, 72 hours of jail and uh, a rupee equivalent to, I don't know, seven pounds, something like that. So if they let him do this, there will be people making salt, there will be no tax. If they arrest him, he'll walk free in three days and become a future hero of India self determination movements, which is exactly what happened. So the idea that you're putting your opponent between the rock and a hard place is a genius of dilemma action. So how you design this, how you understand this, how you build this. And I mean, it comes, comes amazing. It's like you have this protest in Burma and then the police will intervene and they say, oh, wow, these guys are violent. So next day, you have a Disney princess protest in Burma. Everybody is dressed like frozen. So they really look threatening and like they're going to attack the military, yes? And then they take their pets out. So the pets are protesting as well because pets are obviously very dangerous. Lukashenko and Putin were within the range of six months, both forced to arrest snowmen. <laughs> Yes, yeah, some of the people building that snowman are still in jail in Russia. I'm serious. Lukashenko would be arresting the snowman only for being red and white, because this is the color of protest. We found 23 different dilemma actions tied only to the potholes. It's an amazing thing. So people would paint their mayor around the pothole. So when you hit the pothole, you hit the mayor in his mouth. The same out which promised that the potholes will be fixed. But then you have a person to curse, because this is what you do when you hit the pothole, you curse. People would plant trees in potholes. That's Zimbabwe. People would plant flowers in potholes. That's 12 different countries. People will celebrate the birthdays of the potholes because they tend to grow. Yeah, there is a group in Mexico which every year it celebrates the birthday of the largest pothole in Mexico City. People will put water in potholes and release fish. 
Nice, environmentally friendly, yes? We stock trout and stuff. So 20, like very uninspiring, very non-political thing like potholes immediately becomes a rallying point of creativity. And then if you're a mayor, what will you do? Will you let everybody hitting your mouth with their car every day? Or you will fix that pothole? If you fix the damn potholes, I win. If you remove graffiti and leave the potholes, you look like an idiot. So these are, you have only two options. And both are very bad, yes? So it's everywhere. We have a lot of these in the US now, where these are the, someone might, like where we are looking at the well-structured prankster groups like Yes Men. You've heard of Yes Men? So I mean, these guys are amazing in creating dilemmas. So when Volkswagen had this big scandal a few years ago about lying about their emissions, what they did, they mimicked the letterhead, they appeared to know the communication type of Volkswagen's PR, and immediately all the top news media desks in the US got a letter from Volkswagen, which was looking from Volkswagen, but it's actually coming from the Yes, man, saying we, the Volkswagen, are terribly sorry for this. And we, as a Volkswagen, want to apologize to all of our customers around the United States. This was not fucking Volkswagen, it was these two guys. Now, what will you do if you're a Volkswagen? Would you come out and say, no, it's not us, we are not sorry? <laughs> or you will say, yes. We should really say we are sorry, these guys are right. And look back. So it's like the, these things are amazing because they all play into what is widely held belief. And the widely held belief is obviously if you take public money and you say we'll fix the potholes, fix the damn potholes. If you are a big car manufacturer and you lie about your emissions, then damn at least apologize. So these things are not starting with a tactic, they're starting with a widely held belief. You need to identify the soft spot between the entity, company, government doing something and how do they want you to perceive them. And once you expose this, this is where the genius kicks in. There's a group called Indivisible in US, probably the best practitioners of these kind of stuff. So what they would do two midterms ago when healthcare was a big Democrat thing, they will be coming on a town hall. And they will be coming at the town halls where the members of the Congress coming from Republican Party would be holding town halls. And they were very polite and they were trained to appeal in a different side of the hall and trained to stand out and to be really visible. And they will ask only one question. What my XYZ and kid on the medication will do if you cancel Obamacare. And then again, and then again, and then again. Uh, very polite, very nice, not harsh at all, just in big numbers. So now these guys start canceling the town hall because there was only one issue on the town hall and they didn't like to talk about this issue. But then the people say, okay, where are our representatives? So immediately the billboards start popping across the United States with the face of Senator or Congressman XYZ. It's like missing. <laughs> if you see this guy, call immediately and then there's a phone number. And then they will organize their own city hall. And then they will be talking to the suits or they will carve the, the cardboard senator and congressman and bring them there to be there. And now immediately, of course, it draws from the widely held belief that if you're elected for public office in the United States, time after time, you should be meeting your lawyers and answering their questions, even if they disagree with you. So all of these things were super interesting to find and figure out how they function. But once again, the reason why I'm giving you this vast number of things, it's not related to one topic. It's not, there are zillions of cases of corruption, zillions of cases of environment, zillions of cases of co company abuse, and of course, zillions of cases of politics, but not only politics. This works in almost any segment of public activism. 
So now the big thing, which, which is why we have an expert in political satire here. Here comes Sophia McLennan, the world's largest expert in Saturday Night Live. And this is very different from a joke and satire. Joke and satire, it's a one phenomenon and you can mock people and how you mock people also matters. This is an active tactic that makes your opponent react. So the difference is in whether you are engaging or you're commenting and mocking and making everybody makes fun. Also, how you do it, am I telling that you are funny or am I making you do something and then you look funny? This is where the big difference is. And the power of dilemma action and loftivism is in creating a situation in which your opponent mocks him or herself, as opposed to you mocking him or her. So, Sophia calls it playful irony. And then, of course, the structure. So each single one of these things starts with a widely held belief. And these are some examples. Gatherings are illegal. In Belarus, in Zim, you assemble more than five people, it's a political rally. You don't declare a political rally to the police, you get arrested. Five people, illegal. So what about six people reading the state constitution of Belarus on a public square? Six, not five. Not 10,000, just six. So it's enough to be illegal, but then they will be arresting you for reading the state constitutional line and charge you with illegal, charging you with attempt to bring the constitutional order of Belarus by walking in a public square and reading the country constitution loud. Okay? So people, they're amazing cases. So some of these cases are absolutely amazing. Also, we figure out that some of these cases work every time. And some of these cases are dilemma actions per se. Not all the tactics are dilemma action per se, but there is a very specific group of tactics that every time is like the hunger strike of a super prominent opposition leader. It's always a dilemma. If you let this person die, as opposed to if we, you know, comply with what they want. Well-organized general strike. There is no way you can ignore the well-organized general strike. You must react to the well-organized general strike. Lysistratic ostracism. It's one of the, my favorite tactics. It's such a complicated name, but this is basically women denying sex to men. Four governments. Four coalition governments were made only in Africa by the wives of the party leaders, uniting in their strategic sex denial to their husbands until four governments. Amazing. So th this was also research where we learned a lot. There are some things which simply work. And these are the potholes, yes. Okay. Come on. And then if you use technology, this is Panama City. This is my favorite. So Panama City is this Miami of the Central Americas. It has all these tall buildings built on tax evasion. And the streets are like, you know, streets are the streets of Panama City. The buildings are the buildings of Miami, but the streets are. So they, they hired the Sogili Mallet. This is done by, by a PR agency. There's this piece of technology which looks like a hockey pack, like the rubber thing. And when you put this thing in a pothole, it's a hard rubber, but it has a thing inside. So when the tire goes over it, when it's pressed like a landmine, it tweets. And it tweets straight to the mayor account. And each one has an ID and saying, oh, I'm the pothole at the corner of Cascade and Second Avenue. And I just heard the card of this beautiful old lady, fix me, fix me, fix me. <laughs> 14,000 tweets a day. <laughs> because there are plenty of potholes. And imagine this guy, he's opening kindergartens. It's like, but he's bing, 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 notification. Everybody talks about the pothole. 
So it's like that, the, the 23 different ways to treat just the potholes. It's really impressive. Also, it works very well against the extremist groups. There's the whole family of great work on neo-Nazis by this type of tactics, because they're a very specific target. They like to look serious, but in the same time, they want to be portrayed as a victim. So you, you need to understand their intentions. So there is a group of, of far right people. So they love this. They also love this very dramatic mythological names in Helsinki, Finland. They call, call themselves the sons of Odin, which is the supreme god of the Nordic religion. And they will be in black uniforms and they will just patrol the parts of the town where the Finnish people live between the parts of the town where these dangerous immigrants live, they wouldn't touch anybody, they wouldn't be armed, but they would just show that they are the protectors of the people. Clever, yes? So people kind of were scared and they were protesting and then they figure out the solution. So they form a local group. They even, they even registered it as an initiative, which are called the Clowns of Odin. So now every single son of Odin marching in his black uniform would be accompanied with a clown of Odin. <laughs> Marching dressed up as a clown, what else? And now what will you do? Because you lose this, oh, I am the bully, I am the protector, you somehow become the target. You either need to stop marching or attack clown, in both cases you lose. Okay, Wundisdale, Germany, amazing place. There's this town in Germany, which is pretty liberal, small town, but unfortunately for it, it's also birthplace of a guy named Rudolf Hess, one of the Hitler's most important lieutenants. So every year, the tens of thousands of neo-Nazis and far-right guys from all over the Germany come to pay honor at the birthday of Rudolf Hess. Of course, the whole guard, guard, the people don't like it in this town. They go underground, they clock shops. It's like, until somebody came to the great idea that maybe we can use this opportunity to fundraise. So they mobilize all the local businesses and they make marks each 100 years or whatever throughout the town where the procession will go. So every 100 years, every 200 years, the marchers were actually raising money for the organization called Exit Germany, which is the organization which Kind of, kind of rehab for extremists, so where you go to rehab. So here are these people happy to march, and now the whole village, the whole city is around and everybody's applauding because they're supporting their march because they're raising money. It's like one of these, you know, you run for every two miles, somebody gives you $50 to fight cancer or something like that, yeah? This is a very similar type of thing. So here they are marching as a bond. This is congratulations, you raised 2.5 thousand euros. 5,000 euros, 10,000 euros for each 100 meter of the mark. They canceled it after that. <laughs> so next year, there was no one this day march. But you see how the thinking comes into putting your opponent between the rock and the hard place. And you also need to understand what your opponent craves from this. They crave to be attacked. They crave to be victims because they can always comply and say, this is a free speech country. Okay, basically humor breaks fear and apathy. Humor makes your movement cool. Loftivism puts your opponent between rock and a hard place. Now the research, this is us. I look very serious. I was, but it's a funny thing, the serious photo was made in a Charlie Hebdo desk in Paris for my French version of the book, which is my, 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 my shirt is all screwed up. Joe, Sophie and myself, a lot of young people, a lot of students from, from, from uh, Penn State contributed into this. Three products that we are looking at for now on. One is the book that Sophia mentioned that you can get a copy in front. Pranksters versus Autocrats. Another one is this research, which we now published in GOD, but we tend to make it a little bit bigger. 
And now we're building a website where we can really look the regions and what works and what were the topics. Eventually, this website called Tactics for Change will be also editable, so people can add their own things. So it will become a collection of inputs from different environments. Findings are uh, amazing. Like out of 400 cases, 40% were dilemma action. 85% of these cases produced outsized or sympathetic media coverage. 86 of them sparked some kind of response. 46% of them produce some kind of concessions, like filling the potholes. Public sympathy, reframing narrative, appeal to a certain segment of violence, blow back if you react. Stupid police dragging things to the car, chief of police banning the toy protests. This is specifically where we are looking at. Also fear reduction and in my case, very important thing, increase participation. So where these movements were using this at the beginning as a launching point or in the engagement phase of the movement, they were able to recruit more people through this type of action and that matters the most. So from here, we have a research team meeting tomorrow. Hopefully we are going to launch Tactic for Change in March, then take a look at measuring reactions between these tactics and conventional tactics. So in order to really figure out, you know, we need to compare this to the traditional things like protests, and then we are going for the larger grants. Without further ado, I'll stop here and open it for a question. Hope this was fun. probably need to press there is a little button that you cannot find but if you press it will work this one works however oh, is it working now no nope. <laughs> you see technology should make your life easier hi i'm going into education i'm i was wondering if you had any tips for like educating the youth like uh, younger like 15 16 year olds on like how to better like advocate for themselves via your methods uh, we've done some workshops for high school kids. Uh, we've done some work workshops for very, I have the one on me, I think, a very young audience, uh, specifically for people from Fridays for Future. Like this is probably the youngest group I've ever worked with. Uh, they, they understand the tactical part, they understand great, because it's a lot of fun. And, uh, but I think what you mentioned is probably the most important thing. I think people power generally this idea that by a nonviolent action, you can change things. This should be something that you guys get exposed at the age of 15, 16, because you know, it will inspire you to do various stuff. So yes, we have some experience training younger people, but I would be really passionate to see it as a part of the school curriculum, maybe a serious test would be, you know, teaching it in some high schools and figuring out what you get when these people get to universities, these people get in 20s, 30s, I mean, and then follow the result. But it works definitely. Hi, thank you. So um, I've done some community organizing in Miami surrounding gun violence. And I know you say that you need like three to 5% of the population to agree with something for a movement to, you know, really be mm -hmm. successful. But the gun movement of um, the anti-gun movement in the US, like it's very popular, but yet it hasn't been able to be successful. So mm -hmm. how do you like, how would you Suggest yeah, okay. That. So that, um, being a non-American, I, 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 I'm always kind of offensive towards Americans. One of the things I, I, I very, really piss me off is that Americans are not learning from their own history, which is what Serbs don't do also, but I, I, I wouldn't really show off with that. <laughs> so gun control movement is a really interesting thing 
and uh, I'm amazed to which level they a didn't use the experience of the civil rights movement, for example, which was super effectively tackling businesses in order to change politics. Montgomery bus boycotts, death clowns, counter occupations in Nashville. So they understood that the lawmakers wouldn't move a finger. Lawmakers in Alabama wouldn't move a finger because they were elected by the people who loved segregation. Uh, Mark Rubio wouldn't move a finger because of this big tick check he gets from NRA. It doesn't matter, but he's the wrong target. He is not going to move, but businesses would. So there is this amazing case of Parkland, Florida, which should be put in a booklet, educational video, and every single gun control organization in America should have a workshop based on that case study. Why? I don't know who advised this group of people. I would like to meet this person because it's really amazing. So they figured out in the step one that there is no way they can use the Parkland Florida shooting for pushing anything through the administration of Florida, run by a nice little guy called DeSantis. No, that was Rick Scott. Yeah, I mean, whatever. Obviously, that's not the pet. That's the wrong pillar. So they were looking at the two different directions. One direction is who sold this gun? Bus boycott thinking. Okay. So they did a little research and figure out that 73% of guns in Florida or in their county in Florida, I'm not sure about the scope, but it's the same thing. He sold through the big chains. Walmart, big sporting goods, bus pro shops, Cabela's, I don't know, name it. And they start threatening these businesses with boycott if they don't do the background check. So they figure out they will never get the background checks through Marco Rubio. But they were looking at these businesses. And unlike politicians, businesses are not thinking with ideolo uh, ideology. They're thinking with revenue. So like I live, I live in Colorado Springs, and now we have like two big sporting goods and one bus for shops and stuff like that. And if the people of your age stop buying their Colombian Patagonia apparel there, that will cost these shops more then putting the background checks and maybe people who wouldn't do a background check to buy a weapon migrating to the other store. You understand the loss for businesses will be far bigger if the teenagers stop buying their Nike shoes as opposed to the people who buy guns migrate from them into the small businesses. The moment these two things are, are, are in that kind of balance, they will put the background check. That's how the businesses think. They are, they're not thinking with ideology or politics, they're thinking with the revenue. So they effectively impose the background checks on stores that are selling 73% of the weapons without Marco Rubio or Rick Scott. Now they turn their eyes into the source of evil, which is the NRA. So instead of crying out loud how Marco Rubio is in the pocket of NRA, which it's not going to hurt NRA, it's not going to hurt Marco Rubio, and everybody knows it. They were looking at what discounts you get as a member of NRA. So they make Delta, United, Avicenta car, and a chain of hotels whose name I don't remember, to divest, to stop giving discounts to the members of NRA. You know what happened with NRA? NRA is bankrupt. Now, file for bankruptcy. Or oh, people will say it's a scandal, it's a corruption, but basically in 2020, NRA was able to donate to Republicans one third of what it was able to donate to Republicans in 2016, which tells you that they are having a money problem, not only the leadership problem. If this is taught and trained, with hundreds of thousands of the people who care about the gun control across the United States. So every time you come to the school shooting, instead of thoughts and prayers, 
people start popping up the question, okay, where did this guy bought that car? That's one question. Just where it is bought? Where? And it's probably pretty easy to figure that out. Because most of these guns are purchased legally over the counter in a places like the exporting goods. Some of them are coming from the black market. It's a very small portion. Eight out of ten times probably you will be able to trace the gun to the shop and then attack the shop. And this will work every time, regardless of whether you're doing it in California or Kansas. Doesn't matter whether this is a blue or the red state, the exporting goods will be afraid of losing revenue or whoever sold the gun. I'm unfair towards the exporting. And I intentionally don't mention bus pro shops, don't touch bus pro shops. <laughs> But the idea is you go there and follow the certain pattern and then take a look at the local NRA and then make people divest from local NRA. And if you train people this way, so every time you have a school shooting, this vigil and candles, they're not in front of the church, they're in front of Walmart. That's the only thing you need to do. And you know that there will be opportunities because Unfortunately, there will be another school shooting in the next three weeks. It will happen inevitably. The question is, are you waiting for this ready with people trained, with the idea of what they need to do? And with this, this is exactly when I say not all tactics are born equal. 10,000 people can be quietly, vigilantly mourn five kids killed in the school. Or these same 10,000 people can make change and prevent next school shooting from happening. So it's not whether you can mobilize 10,000 people after the school shooting, yes, you can. It's what you do with this 10,000 people that really matters. Hi, uh, my name is Evan Sutton. I'm from San Francisco and a part time labor organizer for the IWW over in Oakland. Mm -hmm. What do you think organ what role do you think organized labor plays in democratic movements across the world? And even more so, what role do you think organized labor plays mm. in tactics of laptivism? Uh, I'm not pretty sure about the tactics of laptivism, but I think organized labor is a, is a very important uh, power behind this. We see it a little bit more recently in the United States, but in Europe, if they organize, they can block the country and anything that can block the country or the business uh, uh, makes a lot of sense. I would like to see more, more role of this thing. I mean, it's like probably the first year I've seen a big victory for organized labor, this car strike which happened recently. And uh, uh, I think the thing the once again, the road to many state changes doesn't run through the street, doesn't necessarily run through the ballot. It runs through businesses. Okay, let us think unthinkable. We want to help Ukraine. No brainer. We know who the good guys are. We know who the bad guys are. Now, what we can do from here, I mean, yeah, we can raise some money and buy generators for city. If we are militant, we can raise some money and buy drones. We can be super frustrated that Congress is sitting on a bill, which by the way, boosts American uh, military industry of helping Ukraine. But you can also take a look at the businesses that still operate and pay taxes in Russia. One of them being Domino's Pizza. So your target is down the street. And if you organize the people of this college to boycott Dominus Pizza, and you organize the union, in, like you understand the power of many things, and then you go after Dominus Pizza, and then you go after Carl's Jr., which is still open in Moscow, and then you go after Subway. So there are targets for you to change things which are accessible to you. And a lot of them are businesses. 
So if you have organized labor within these businesses, then they can also impact the politics of these businesses, not only the salary and this typical, you know, organized labor topics, but they can also impact the, the outcomes. Like, it's like, I don't want to walk, I don't want to be working in a company where people come and spit me because I'm funding a genocide. I, I'm not into funding the genocide. I'm just selling burger, pizza, something. <laughs> It's like you, there is, it's a big role because a lot of these changes are running through the company, not only in US, but elsewhere as well. How about having the Walmart labor organization asking for a background check? It's a big deal, yeah. I mean, they would need to do something about it. That's the point. We'll take one more and then we have also a chance to keep talking to Serja, catch a photo with him and we have some snacks and stuff outside. So after that. Hi, um, my name is Vaishnavi. Um, thank you so much for the talk you just gave and everything. Um, so my question was related to, again, how you're talking about how people should organize and come together and boycott the business. Why do you think there is a lack of that right now? Like, why haven't people already come to do that? And is there also, do you think, a big wave of more like performance, like activism, where people are like, hey, I'm going to go do this, but don't actually go and do it? Mm. So the second question is easier to ask. The answer is yes. People very often ask me, so what would you do in Serbia if you had Twitter? I would say we would probably fail because a lot of these performative activism thing is just me farting my anger on the social networks and thus thinking that I'm doing something useful, which doesn't have the impact on the real world. Second things, uh, I don't know why, why, well, it takes a lot of strategic thinking to do these tactics properly. One of the most important, one of the most common sentences I've ever heard in 20 years of my career working with activists is, oh, I don't have time for planning. I'm too busy doing it. If I was given a dollar every time that I heard this, I would probably drive the Bentley. Okay, every time. So you need first to think like the reason why there is no more of this is because the people very often, when you have a large protest, the people are driven by emotions and they're driven viscerally. And they are more often angry than strategic. Because when you're angry, you're less strategic. Everybody knows that, yes? So you go, in, but the, the cure for this is if you educate enough people why things work when they work, and once again, it's a purpose of training. And if you break this down, there's also a very interesting issue, these tangible victories. Like there's this guy called Saul Alinsky, which 60s wrote this amazing book, which was a Bible of the liberal organizers called Rules for Radical. It's not a radical book at all. And he has this theory that the anger is a very powerful mobilizer, but the anger without hope is a destructive force per se, because you make people angry and then they burn the building. And, uh, but what connects the two is the small victories. So how do you make small tangible things in a gun control movement? First, we take on the exporting goods and then on Walmart. And then it's like, you make this kind of a monopoly game or you make this kind of chess. And first we take a pawn and then we take a knight and then we take a queen. And then we check me. And it's like people, when they see, when they, there are also reality checks around it. And businesses are playing the, the big role in this. But for some reason, uh, people don't see the power that it brings. It's like, I hate to say this, but when you work with people from fucked up countries, like seriously fucked up, people under harsh dictatorships, people under juntas, like in Burma. Burma and Sudan are excellent examples of what we call micro-targeting, because they cannot target the government because they'll be killed. They are forced to think about the alternative ways. So their thinking is far more sophisticated 
because you Americans, you can go and protest in front of what's so fucking ever. Capitol Hill, a party headquarters, uh, Dean's office, they can't. So when Junta struck Burma two years ago, they figure out that out of the 15 generals that are running the show now, seven are multimillionaires and they have businesses. So they try protesting on the street and they own the street and then they got killed and arrested and thrown into concentration camps. And then they figure out that one of them is owning the largest country brewery. So because they were highly organized, the whole Burma start immediately boycotting that beer. And of course they trace the money and the largest investor in that brewery is a large brewery from Japan called Asahi. So in Japan, reputation matters. So they made a naming and shaming campaign in Japan. Asahi divested from the Burmese brewery. They started boycotting brewery inside the country. Brewery was bankrupt. General was better off before the coup. Then they moved into the largest cigarette production. And now they're moving to the world of the national oil company. If Chevron and Total divest from the Burmese national oil company, these are two big companies, one from US, one from France, the Burmese junta wouldn't be able to control and pay for the military salary. And you can find their headquarters because they're in Paris. And you can access them without the danger to be killed because you will not be killed in Paris because you are protesting in front of the Chevron. It's not going to happen. Macron is not going to do this to you. And I don't totally somewhere, I don't know, Texas, wherever. Arizona, Nevada, whatever. So you can find and trace things. So they are more politically sophisticated, probably because they don't have other choice. Whether in America you need to tell people, you know, how about Walmart? The people here don't see the connection, clear connection. But they've done it in the past. Montgomery bus boycott was that, 101. Well, let's keep this conversation going. Thank you very much. <clears throat>